Okay, welcome back to the Modesto Simpkins School of Human Rights. Uh, today, of course, is May Day in most of the rest of the world. And of course, in the ultimate example of American exceptionalism here in the U.S., it is Loyalty Day. Uh, of course, we are celebrating much more the former than the latter. Uh, and tonight, we are honored and privileged to welcome a special guest to our class this evening, Dr. Terry Taylor of the Citadel, who has written and researched extensively on the history of labor in South Carolina and across the South, especially uh, focusing on Charleston in particular. We're going to be talking about uh, the history of labor in the Palmetto State during the Great Depression New Deal era and how this links extensively to the history of right to work laws in the South and across the country. Now, in reference to today being uh, May Day, um, I also wanted to read um, a brief selection from a speech given by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1961, who was another stalwart ally of labor. Um, by the way, it seems there's an issue with the volume, according to the folks in the chat. I, uh, I just adjusted it. It should, oh. should be better now. Excellent. Turned it down when we were singing. Yeah. Uh, I, probably with the reason for some of us, at least, but I digress. Okay. Uh, I kid. But I wanted to read just a little bit from, from Dr. King's speech. This is one that he gave uh, to the AFL-CIO on December 11th, 1961. The title of the speech is, If the Negro Wins, Labor Wins. <laughs> and I just wanted to read a couple of paragraphs from it. The two most dynamic and cohesive liberal forces in the country are the labor movement and the Negro freedom movement. Together, we can be architects of democracy in a South now rapidly industrializing. Together, we can retool the political structure of the South, sending the Congress steadfast liberals who, joining with those from the Northern industrial states, will extend the frontiers of democracy for the whole nation. Together, we can bring about the day when there will be no separate identification of Negroes and labor. There is no intrinsic difference, as I have tried to demonstrate, Differences have been contrived by outsiders who seek to impose disunity by dividing brothers because of the color of their skin, uh, because the color of the skin has a different shade. I look forward confidently to the day when all who work for a living will be one with no thought to their separateness as Negroes, Jews, Italians, or any other distinction. This will be the day when we shall bring into full realization the American dream, a dream yet unfilled a dream of equality of opportunity, of privilege and property widely distributed, a dream of a land where men will not take necessities from, it, from the many to give luxuries to the few, a dream of a land where men will not argue that the color of a man's skin determines the content of his character, a dream of a nation where all our gifts and resources are held not for ourselves alone, but as instruments of service for the rest of humanity, the dream of a country where every man will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. That is the dream. So I just wanted to read that from Dr. King's speech. If, uh, if, the, if labor wins, if Negro wins, labor wins, given on December 11th, 1961. Um, so of course, as I mentioned earlier, we are gonna turn the floor over to Dr. Carrie Taylor. Um, again, as I mentioned before, uh, he's written extensively on uh, labor. He has actually edited several volumes of the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. papers as well. And tonight he is here to talk about how South Carolina has been a central battleground in the worldwide struggle for labor, dignity, and freedoms. Dr. Taylor, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Green and and uh, class, I'm uh, uh, you know really happy to be here tonight. I've been following the work you've been doing all uh, term, and uh, um, just I'm very admiring and excited about uh, the Majeska School because uh, it, you know it's the the content is uh, incredible. Um, you know, so rich, but I think connected to all of the work that you do and the, the connections you have 
uh, I think that raises the stakes and, you know, what you're doing. It's not just a, a good thing that you're doing, but it's uh, it's important. It's essential. So um, it's it is an honor to to be with you uh, tonight. Um, I'm uh, tonight. What, what I'm going to be doing is, I, I think, three things. Um, the first is exploring the long history of South Carolina's right to work law. Um, Second, I'm going to try to attempt something of an argument regarding the uh, right to work law and its uh, significance. And then uh, I want to hear from everyone in the room to hear from you all um, regarding your thoughts and how you think uh, right to work has an impact on uh, the, the, the work that you're all doing. And I recognize that uh, there's a lot of uh, tremendous expertise in the room here. So I'd encourage you, uh, you know, even as we go along, put comments on the in the chat, uh, you know, corrections, uh, you know, any remarks are appreciated. And uh, I'll also rely on uh, Professor Green to keep me on pace here and uh, hurry me up uh, if if necessary. So uh, what I'm going to do is um, move to uh, to share my screen and, um, you know, uh, please let me know if you have any uh, issues with this, but I think this should work. How's that? Oh, yes, that's fantastic. Good, good. Okay. So, uh, right to work, South Carolina. Um, here's, uh, I, I, I guess I, I want to start with the headline. And uh, in some ways, this might be your most important takeaway. Uh, if you don't remember anything, um, I, I hope that it's this. And that is that your right to join a union is uh, protected by the Constitution. And I know that uh, there's a lot of confusion around there, uh, around that uh, with regards to, to South Carolina. I'll, I'll often hear, uh, uh, you know, people will tell me, oh, you know, this is a right to work state. So, uh, you know, we can't join unions. Well, that's that's absolutely not the, the case that, your right to join a union is constitutionally protected, and that would include any resident of the United States, uh, citizen, non-citizen. Um, the only uh, group who this uh, does not include would be incarcerated <laughs> workers. And even for people who are workers who are incarcerated, uh, it, it's kind of a gray area. There have been uh, efforts to organize unions within pr prisons, and uh, um, those have had uh, some, you know, but, uh, mixed results. But um, but again, your your right to join a union. You know, and and uh, just you know, the the photo here is a, a good example of that. These are uh, uh, five women who've worked in healthcare, who okay. worked. Uh, on the waterfront, worked for public sector employers, private employers, uh, something of a hybrid with the Ports Authority, but all of them have the right to, to join a union, uh, as, as do you. So what is uh, this uh, right to work? What, what is that all about? Um, so uh, in 1954, South Carolina uh, adopted a right to work uh, law and what that states is that, or uh, what that means is that uh, you, as an employer employee, can elect to be a union member, or you can elect not to be a union member, um, uh, and uh, you're not required to pay dues or fees. So, if a union wins an election where you're working. Uh, provided uh, you know you're in the the private sector, the union will negotiate. They're obligated to negotiate on behalf of the entire workforce. But um, you know whether or not you're a union, that's uh, you are part of the union. That that's really up to you. 
What that's given rise to, and this is the, the argument of the, um, the, the labor movement, is that gives rise to the problem of free riders. So in right to work states, workers know that they don't have to pay any dues or fees, but they'll, they'll be represented anyway. So what's the incentive there to, to pay dues and fees? You know, it becomes very difficult. Um, so, uh, but it, it's also, I, th I think there's a lot of um, the, I, the, the differences between states with right to work laws of which there are about 25 or 26, uh, and those states that do not, um, the only difference here, uh, well, the, the uh, you know, what's universal is that workers cannot be forced to join a union in any of the 50 states. But in those states without right to work laws, uh, you can be required to pay uh, some fees for services if that's negotiated between the union and the employer through a union security agreement agreement. Uh, but, you know, that, that's it. That's the difference. And um, uh, it's uh, a little bit different in the, um, uh, the, the public sector. And this grows out of a, uh, it really comes out of the Charleston hospital strike when the attorney general issued a finding that it is not the policy of the state of South Carolina to allow for uh, any uh, body of government to negotiate with uh, or to enter into collective bargaining content contract with their employees. So what that means is that uh, if you're a city, state, or county worker, you can still join a union, but uh, the state agency or the governing body that you work for is going to be prohibited from collective bargaining. Um, nevertheless, uh, in um, uh, uh, but a number of public sector workers have used uh, what, what's referred to as meet and confer to engage in kind of backdoor negotiations. Probably the, the union that's been most successful in doing that are the, the firefighters. Um, Charleston firefighters, for example, uh, is one of the, dates back to World War I, one of the oldest unions in the state. And what the firefighters will do is, uh, uh, you know, they'll meet with the, the Charleston City Council and with the mayor uh, during budgeting, um, the, the budgeting period and budgeting negotiations, and they will informally uh, negotiate a pay raise and uh, sometimes other kind of changes to work rules and that kind of thing. And that's the way that they've been able to, to get around uh, this um, prohibition against uh, public sector workers from uh, being protected by uh, union contracts. I, I want to just pause here for a second, because I think that's that's a lot, and I want to just make sure that's uh, clear. And I'll, um, I see the, the question in here. Um, can public school teachers join a collective bargaining uh, organization and can public sector. So uh, in the state of, of South Carolina, um, you know, te technically know that uh, public school teachers would not be covered by a collective bargaining agreement uh, because of the uh, 1969 uh, attorney general ruling. Uh, teachers can, you know, join unions and form unions. And, and uh, this has been uh, you know, in the the uh, the red for ed movement a couple of years ago, I know there was a lot of confusion around that, where um, some teachers were reluctant to get involved based on their misunderstanding of the law. But um, as a, a public sector employee, including a teacher, you can um, uh, uh, join a union, but you're it's it's uh, unlikely, it's uh, impossible, it's prohibited by law. Uh, for your um, uh, school district to negotiate a collective bargaining agreement. Um, uh, you also, Randall asked if uh, public sector workers can strike. Generally, no. I think there are some exceptions across the country where state legislatures have enabled uh, uh, public employees to strike in a, a couple of places. But I think generally the uh, uh, 
the, the, the law is that public sector workers, while uh, they can organize in many states, in many parts of the country, um, they uh, uh, can't, can't use the, the power of the strike. And uh, Herb, let me, um, I'll circle back to that. I'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the sanitation workers. And, uh, you know, that's one I'll also try to, to put that back on you. I'd uh, like to hear your, your take on this. So uh, that's the law. And it's, um, you know, I, I think pretty straightforward. Try to... Uh... Question? No, I have a question. Oh, yeah. Um, is it not true that teachers have the right to strike in certain areas? Because I've heard of teachers striking recently. Yeah, I, generally, public sector workers will not. But uh, as I said, there are some states in which, uh, you know, teachers are allowed to strike oh, yeah. and other public sector workers. State by state. Yeah. Anybody can not work. Yeah. You can, well, they can have a sick out, blue flu, whatever. <laughs> they can't stop you from striking. Forcing you to work would be, you yeah. know, slavery. It may not get you anything because you don't have the bargaining rights. Trying to advance the slide here. We were, yeah, we were filling the time for you. There we go. Um, so, uh, how, how did we get here? What's the, the long history of right to work? I think we've got to go back to the 1930s, to the Great Depression, and the crisis of capitalism, not just in South Carolina, but, uh, you know, across the country, really uh, across the world. You know, the 1930s were a decade of tremendous upheaval and mass protest. Uh, all around the country, but um, but also in South Carolina. Last night, uh, some of us were together to watch the Uprising 34 about the general textile strike, uh, which is a, a powerful reminder of South Carolina's uh, militant labor history and the central role that South Carolina has played in American labor history, which I think is you know oftentimes forgotten. But during the Great Depression, uh, you had, um, you know, there were these continuing battles between uh, groups that amassed, you know, somewhat spontaneously and organically to demand jobs down at uh, county welfare offices. Um, there are uh, news reports of, you know, hundreds of women lining up to uh, receive flour or um, uh, uh, vegetables, which were trucked in from the countryside just to, to keep people fed. Um, so, uh, you know, that's happening, but, you know, these kinds of, and, and oftentimes, uh, the, you know, these were, um, you know, under sort of, if everything went well, these were orderly gatherings, but, um, if, uh, you know, they're, the, if, if, if the uh, county agents ran out of food or, uh, there weren't enough jobs to go around, uh, you know, things could get, um, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty wild there. And there, uh, the police, are constantly being forced to intervene to, um, uh, you know, restore order uh, in these situations. But that's that's also, you know, the the kind of protest that's taking place uh, in the streets is also mirrored uh, in the the factories and in in the mills of South Carolina. And I I mentioned briefly the case of uh, last night, I talked a little bit about the Charleston Bagging Mill, where uh, which is a, a major employer in uh, Charleston in the 1930s. They employed uh, men and women, black and white, to manufacture the jute bags that were used to, uh, to ship cotton. And in the late summer of 1933, uh, the women, uh, African American women in the weaving department of the black, the bagging mill, uh, received word that their sisters and their cousins across town at the cigar factory had received raises under the federal codes that were then being implemented to uh, uh, stabilize the economy. 
And the women at the, the, the bagging industry was not yet covered. There were no codes that were issued at this time for the bagging mill. And so the women stopped work, they sat down, uh, they dismantled their equipment and uh, weaponized it. And they brandished these blades first at their managers and said, we're, we're not working until you pay us $12 a week, uh, just like uh, other workers in Charleston. Um, the uh, supervisors, you know, beat a hasty retreat and uh, went a couple blocks down to to uh, get the um, uh, alert the police. Uh, a couple of police officers show up at first, and uh, the the they would describe. They're interviewed in the the newspaper later, and they they described it uh, as being transported to uh, somewhere in Africa. They said the, the women were stripped down to their underclothes. They were dancing and chanting. Uh, they were, uh, you know, yelling mean things at us. And uh, they, uh, at some point, they were chanting, uh, uh, strip down, strip down. And they were demanding that the, the pops take off their clothes uh, before they were going to uh, negotiate with them. Those two police officers went and got reinforcements. Finally, they were able to get the workers out of the mill but the entire mill was shut down for 10 days as a result of that strike. And in the meantime, uh, bagging mill managers went up to Washington, D.C., and they said, uh, you know, spoke to government officials and said, uh, you know, by all means, you, you know, you've got to, I, I've got to go back to Charleston with an agreement with uh, some codes that would allow us to, uh, to raise wages. You know, can you implement these uh, wage standards for the whole industry. And in that way, uh, codes were issued for the, the, the bagging industry. Um, uh, the, uh, the, I mentioned that the general textile strike, uh, you know, is um, even though it's, it's a national textile strike, it's really centered in the Carolinas. The most militant workers are in the, the Carolinas and uh, other parts of the South um, you know, probably 400,000 workers went out on strike in 1934. And, uh, you know, these two were, were workers who had been encouraged by Franklin Roosevelt's first crack at a new deal in which it seemed uh, under the National Industrial Recovery Act that they were given the rights to collective bargaining uh, but in reality, and they, they soon found this out, that the federal government had no apparatus to protect those bargaining rights or enforce labor law. And so uh, that led to a, a, a brutal crackdown of the, the, uh, the union and the, the strikers. Um, you know, some were uh, imprisoned. Um, uh, a number of them after the strike were blacklisted and uh, never able to, to get jobs in the industry again. A uh, couple of years, uh, 1936, a couple of years later, um, you have, well, 1934 in San Francisco, the uh, dock workers lead a strike in a, uh, that begins on the waterfront but spreads across the city and becomes a general strike in San Francisco, uh, in which the workers are demanding union recognition for um, uh, the, the, the longshoremen. Happens a, a couple years later in Charleston during a mass organizing drive on the part of the uh, International Longshoremen's Association. They come down the coast from New York and sign up uh, Charleston's African-American dock workers who had their own tradition of organizing that goes back to emancipation. They'd had uh, various unions over the years and, and uh, you know, a, a, a history and a, a tradition of organizing. And they, uh, in the summer of 1936, um, uh, affiliated with the International Longshoremen's Association and became ILA 1422. There was an early test of the ILA when uh, one of the, the employers uh, declined to honor the agreement they'd made regarding overtime. And so 300 workers, 300 longshoremen uh, uh, asserted, uh, uh, they, they showed up at the, um, uh, the pay office 
and they demanded uh, the pay that they felt they were owed. Uh, the, the company, uh, you know, once again calls the, the Charleston police uh, who show up with the city's own submachine gun, which was a, a, a relic from World War I uh, that came with the, the city's only uh, pump shotgun. And, uh, you know, they, they trained those guns on the longshoremen, ended up arresting uh, the leaders and, uh, um, you know, that, that put down that uh, protest in the short term, but in the long term, uh, you know, the ILA was able to uh, force the shippers to recognize uh, their rights to, to collective bargaining. So this, this ferment in the, the early 1930s is going to give urgency to the federal government to pass some federal legislation to protect workers' rights to organize. Uh, it's clear that uh, you know, the, there's uh, too much chaos and instability under the old system and that uh, a new uh, system of uh, labor relations is, is needed. So the uh, Wagner Act is passed in 1935. And what that does is it creates the bureaucracy that uh, first of all enables industrial organization. So over the next decade, uh, the number of unionized uh, uh, American workers goes from three to 14 million members. That's going to lead in the post-war period to uh, mass wealth redistribution with the, the emergence of our working and uh, middle classes in the, the post-war era. And to this day, the National Labor Relations Act uh, and the, the Wagner Act provides the, the structure for um, our modern uh, collective bargaining, uh, our, our labor management relations. Um, just as an indicator of how serious the stakes were and you know, how this was uh, understood from the perspective of the state from the perspective of the employers, from the perspective of Washington, uh, the entire South Carolina congressional delegation was unanimous in their support for the Wagner Act, which, um, you know, from our uh, 21st century perspective, that seems, you know, th that's unimaginable that uh, our delegation would get behind uh, an initiative that emerges out of the labor movement. But uh, Charleston was a, a strong New Deal uh, state. They were uh, really Franklin Roosevelt's most reliable ally during the New Deal. In the uh, four elections that Roosevelt ran, his lowest plurality uh, in uh, South Carolina, I think, was about 85 percent. So uh, he was winning by 88, 90, 93 percent of the, the, uh, the vote. Uh, of course, this is when the, you know, after the Republican Party had been basically terrorized out of existence, but uh, nevertheless, support for Roosevelt was very strong. And for most of the, the Depression into the World War II era, uh, the uh, president had uh, reliable uh, allies in, uh, in South Carolina. So, so that's in you know the the you know what I've at different times called Charleston's Red Decade or South Carolina's Red Decade uh, provides some of the backdrop for the the um, uh, uh, right to work legislation, uh, but then that that continues on into the 1940s and into the the World War II era, and it's during uh, you know what. I refer to here as a, a kind of great unsettling that there's a continuation, uh, really an expansion of organizing opportunities for organized labor as money uh, is pumped into the state of South Carolina to, to build military bases, to uh, build up the, the, um, uh, the port of Charleston and the, the naval shipyard uh, to uh, you know, pump money into infrastructure. Uh, and, uh, you know, as well as all of the, the New Deal programs that were meant to provide relief for families, that creates new organizing opportunities. And so you have in the, during the World War II period, um, probably uh, 
it's you know during World War II that we reach our highest levels of um, uh, uh, organized labor density uh, in South Carolina. That continues into the post-war period. So in 1945, 1946, there was a, a strike wave that had uh, no match in American history, uh, save for the strike wave that uh, erupted in 1919 after the, the, the First World War. And you had uh, you know, uh, defense workers, you had a national steel worker strike in 45, 46. Uh, there were several gender general strikes that broke out over the country. And uh, here in South Carolina, here in Charleston, uh, we had the uh, four-month cigar factory strike at the uh, uh, American Tobacco Company cigar factory on East Bay Street, which is, um, and is this something, I'm wondering if this is something that was covered in an earlier class. Did Have you talked about the cigar factory strike uh, make some reference to it um but yeah go into greater detail if you wish because i think that's an important part of this story too good good thank you so uh yeah you know the the charleston strike from a national perspective it can be seen from uh you know, from the perspective of this post-war wave of uh, uh labor uprisings but uh, at the, the the very local level, uh, this was a strike that was really spearheaded by the African American women who uh, uh, worked at the the cigar factory, and one of their key complaints was that they were sexually harassed by, by uh, coworkers and their their white supervisors, and that's going to drive, uh, in part, uh, that's going to to fuel their mili militancy and their willingness to join what was a communist dominated union, the, the food, tobacco and agricultural workers who were then trying to gain a, a foothold in the American South. And it sent uh, several organizers to Charleston to organize uh, the FTA and, and uh, they were ultimately uh, successful in, in organizing a local in Charleston it was a uh, also unique in that it was probably, uh, and you know somebody could check me here, but this was probably you know until the 1950s or 60s, this was probably the largest uh, multiracial strike in the South in the 20th century at least, uh, because the cigar factory employed uh, both men and women, black and white workers, uh, who are were, were segregated within the, the facility, uh, they were, you know, segregated within the factory, but uh, within the union, uh, they organized uh, 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 together in the, the FTA um, meeting separately at first, but then at some point, um, you know, meeting uh, together, black and white workers. Um, out of that strike, um, uh, you know, the, the strike is probably best remembered um, as kind of the, the uh, really out of that strike uh, grows Charleston's uh, uh, everlasting gift to the civil rights movement, to the labor movement, and to human rights movements uh, all across the world, because it was on the, the picket line down on uh, America Street that the African-American women sang an old gospel song, uh, I Will Overcome. And uh, uh, they, they introduced that song to organizers from the Highlander Folk School in Eastern Tennessee, which was a, a labor training school. Uh, later, it was a, 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 a key uh, training site for the, the civil rights movement. And um, it was there that the song uh, was introduced from Charleston into the labor movement. It became We Shall Overcome, and that, of course, um, you know, becomes the anthem for the civil rights movement. And, uh, you know, beyond that, it's, uh, you know, it's a song that's been sung uh, around, uh, you know, human rights and uh, labor rights protests uh, all around the world. So, um, you know, uh, Polish workers during the solidarity movement sang We Shall Overcome. Uh, South African uh, anti-apartheid activists 
saying we shall overcome uh, during during their protests. So um, again, that's a, a you know really uh, Charleston's in South Carolina's lasting gift to human rights movements uh, all around the the, uh, the country. Uh, Randall, you ask if there, uh, if, I, you know, that's a good question. I don't think so. I think it, maybe at some point they were paid by peace, but I think by the 40s, they had an hourly wage. Um, you know, somebody could check me on that, but, um, but I think they were, um, uh, you know, part of, uh, you know, their strike demands were for pay raises. There was also a real issue within the American Tobacco Company regarding some deferred payments that the workers were promised uh, that weren't paid out, uh, um, uh, that they were promised those and, uh, you know, the war had ended and the workers were saying, well, you know, we were promised these back wages, uh, where are they? And so that was going to fuel um uh, you know, a good bit of the, the militancy behind the cigar factory uh, comes out of those, you know, demands that are uh, intimate, that uh, they're uh, plant wide, uh, they're Charleston wide, and they're, they're also national uh, demands, uh, as you, we put them in the, the larger context of the, the strike wave of 45 and 46. Um, the labor movement seeing an opportunity to, to organize the South uh, floods, uh, the South, including South Carolina, uh, during Operation Dixie, which is uh, an attempt to organize uh, Southern textile workers, the steel industry, uh, any non-union coal miners, really to, to um, furniture workers, um, uh, to, to uh, you know, organized workers in the South, and they realized that as long as the South remained predominantly non-union, that Southern employers would have an edge uh, over uh, over the the Southern workers and and over their union workers in the North as well, uh, because they could always threaten to relocate production uh, down to the South. So Operation Dixie was a massive, uh, though failed effort to. Uh, uh, organize the South and to organize in South Carolina. Um, that lasted for uh, about five years before petering out officially. Operation Dixie ends in 1953. It really wound down in South Carolina uh, in 1951. That nevertheless was going to strike fear in the hearts of Southern employers, South Carolina employers, especially uh, the owners of the and uh, supervisors in the the textile industry, um, and, and then on a, a whole different level, um, you know, on a, a personal level, the mass mobility that that's triggered by uh, World War II with um, uh, you know soldiers moving across the country, moving a, across the globe. Uh, you know, hundreds of that, well, millions of Americans moving to take advantage of new job opportunities, you know, especially in uh, uh, the munitions industries, you know, it, it um, would transform you know, the tens of thousands of people move into Charleston to work at the Naval Shipyard. Same thing happens wherever uh, there are bases that are being expanded, military bases that are being built or uh, uh, expanded. And so what that does, that, that mass mobility is going to uh, challenge traditional gender and racial norms. So there's uh, in the, the oral histories of um, you know, women, young women who uh, left their homes and took jobs in um, industry or uh, enlisted in, in the military, you know, they talk pretty extensively about those the, the feeling uh, their 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 ability to express personal freedoms uh during the the war years and it was you know liberating on a, on a number of different levels that mobility is also going to give rise to uh, the first generation of leadership of the modern civil rights movement as african american gis return to alabama and mississippi and south carolina 
and uh, they fought a war against uh, bigotry and uh, fascism. And, uh, you know, what they encounter at home is uh, oftentimes not very different. So, uh, you know, all of that adds up to a, a tremendous, uh, great unsettling that's experienced by, um, you, you see, you know, you see that uh, uh, the, the the reaction to that, the, the counterattack, uh, and you see that take the form of acts of personal violence, and you know, here in South Carolina, within the the span of three years, you have the the execution of George Stinney, a uh, fourteen year old um, boy who's um, you know charged with. Uh, but you know, intimidate—he's seized from his uh, his mother and interrogated. He uh, confesses without uh, having a um, uh, 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 rights to uh, access to a lawyer. Uh, doesn't even have a, a parent in the room while he's been interrogated. He's convicted and is sentenced to the electric chair and and is uh, electrocuted. Uh, you have the um, uh, the, the uh, brutal beating, the blinding of Isaac Woodard, who uh, was discharged in uh, right around Augusta, Georgia, and was taking a, a bus back home and uh, was pulled off the bus and savagely beaten uh, by a mob and blinded. And then he was put in jail for having uh, instigated a, a riot. Uh, and he was kept, um, he was unable to communicate with family or, you know, with anyone uh, for uh, several days until they were able to track him down. And then in Greenville, there's the the uh, lynching of Willie Earl uh, in 1947. And all of those are examples of the kind of personal violence that um, emerged as a response to all of these unsettling uh, social and cultural changes that that are taking place. This is also going to to, to you know the the uh, those that that same unsettling is going to give rise to uh, the the employer counterattack, uh, and from their perspective, what the what what the the, uh, the the mill owners and the the major employers in the south are going to be looking to do is to roll back all of the progress that workers uh, have made and are making in the 1930s and 1940s. So their dream is to return the country to uh, 1927 or 28, uh, to the years before uh, the New Deal. And so, um, you know, the, the, the best expression of that uh, um, the clearest expression of that with regards to uh, um, labor law is the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947, which is passed over the veto of, of uh, President Truman. It's passed in the, faith, the face of tremendous opposition from the labor movement. And what that would do is that would whittle away uh, a lot of the... the um, uh, 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 the rights that were granted to to uh, uh, Denise says these were attacks on black folks. I'm sorry to to uh, to have not made that uh, absolutely clear. No, these were racist attacks. Uh, you know, taking and the, these are you know three of the the most glaring and uh, vile uh, um, uh, instances. But this is uh, you know this is Southwide and it's happening on uh, you know. Uh, all kinds of levels. Um, the uh, 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 Taft Hartley, so it would um, uh, whittle away at some of the rights that were granted under the the Wagner Act, and so what it would do is things like limit um, pickets and boycotts. So uh, you know, one of the things that it does is that it prohibits secondary pickets or boycotts. So if uh, and, and what this is, this is a direct attack on solidarity. It's a direct attack on the general strikes that took place in 1946 in Oakland and uh, Rochester, among other places. But uh, secondary pickets and boycotts were very effective in the 1930s and 40s 
for advancing labor demands. And the, the way this would work is that if uh, the uh, uh, AFL received word that there was an employer violating the, the rights of carpenters, uh, they'd, they'd show up with uh, um, uh, carpenters, bricklayers, uh, pipe fitters, and bakers and printers, and they would uh, try to shut down the job site, but then they would also protest and picket at their own job site in order to put pressure on, uh, you know, on, on all of the employers, especially where you had industries where, where uh, there was some kind of integration. Um, you know, that could be tremendously effective is to, to, um, uh, to yeah, to, uh, um, you know, could be a, a very effective tool in uh, for, for labor. So Taft-Hartley limits uh, picketing and boycotting, and it also opens the door for states to pass right-to-work laws. Um, just to, to give you a sense of, of uh, you know, where the, the, how the political winds had shifted is, uh, you know, if, if, if South Carolina was unanimous, at least within its congressional delegation, in support of the Wagner Act, um, most of the congressional delegation by 1947 was in favor of the passage of Taft-Hartley. So they had abandoned uh, President Truman and abandoned the New Deal Democratic Party uh, to uh, uh, vote on the, the side of the employers. Um, Senator Olin Johnson was one uh, notable um, exception to that, that he opposed Taft Hartley, um, no doubt in response to his um, base among mill workers in the, the upstate. So what that does is it, it opens the door for South Carolina uh, in the 1950s to pass its own right to work law. And uh, a lot of this is initiated by uh, Governor uh, James Burns, Jimmy Burns, who'd been a senator briefly, a Supreme Court justice, um, you know, one of uh, Franklin Roosevelt's closest advisors, who's, you know, arguably, uh, you know, among the, the five most powerful um, uh, uh, American political figures of, of the 20th century. So Governor Burns uh, proposes to the, the legislature at the beginning of um, uh, the session in 1954 said, we need a right to work law that North Carolina, Georgia, uh, other areas, so other Southern states have already passed their own right to work laws and South Carolina is being left behind because those states are offering advantages to potential employers. Moreover, they're stealing some of our employers. So uh, he would cite several instances of uh, businesses that had relocated uh, across the border in order to, to take advantage of uh, the right to work laws. So in 54, um, uh, in March is when Governor Burns actually signs the, the legislation into law. It enjoyed um, uh, a pretty strong majority in both the House and the Senate, although you had some resistance uh, coming from upstate legislation. Leaders. And again, I think this was in response mostly to their uh, constituents. So you have a, a little bit of pushback against the, the, the governor. Uh, Representative uh, Raymond Eubanks, um, uh, who's out of, out of Spartanburg, was a trade unionist and a, a railway conductor. And uh, Eubanks would, uh, you know, when asked, he would say, I'm, I'm unalterably opposed to right to work. This is merely a brainstorm of the Republicans and big business to put the farmer and the working man under the foot of big business. Um, so he kind of led the, the, the effort to stop right, right to work. He filibustered for um, uh, you know, many hours to, to uh, stall or stop the legislation, but he was ultimately uh, unsuccessful in that. But the, um, you know, I was thinking is, is uh, thinking about the, the uh, South Carolina response to right to work, it, um, it really gave, it, it became, a, it was hotly debated uh, all across the state. 
And uh, the newspapers are filled with letters to the editor in which mill workers are uh, coming down on one side or another of the, the right to work law. And I was thinking, you know, one of the themes that that comes out of Uprising 34 is the the, the theme of memory and, and how workers make sense of the, the, the textile strike in 1934. Um, and I think one way to measure that uh, is to, to read these letters around the right to work law, because there are many, many veterans of the uh, 34 general strike who are trying to make sense of their experiences in the labor movement. And that plays out either in strong support for workers and their rights to organize, um, or uh, you know, for a number of them, it's uh, opposition. Um, at the same time that uh, the state legislature is considering right to work, they're also anticipating the Supreme Court's Brown uh, decision, which comes a couple months after right to work. So there's absolutely uh, a racial dynamic to the passage of South Carolina's right to work law. I think I would have to, or somebody would have to go into the, the papers of the legislators and uh, Governor Burns to, um, to really nail that one down. They're very careful in the, the newspaper accounts uh, don't have any mention of uh, race or um, uh, you know integration or uh, African American workers uh, at all. It's uh, you know all kept on the the level of employment. But um, in North Carolina, which uh, passed a uh, 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 a right to work law seven years earlier, uh, they've been able to to make the um, a, a much more solid connection. Uh, between their right to work law and uh, and also a um, a law that prohibits public sector workers uh, like ours from collective bargaining, um, they've been able to to find that documentation to really nail that and show that it was really part of the the larger strategy of massive resistance to um, uh, to desegregation. So, uh, so you know that that's the the right to work and uh, the the counterattack. So it's um it's at this point that I I wanted to try to I, I suppose um, this is where where things get uh, a little bit dangerous. I'm I'm gonna uh, venture forth uh, an argument here and a. a Love to hear what what you all think about this. Uh, my, my argument is that the real lasting power of right to work legislation in South Carolina might be its symbolic or psychological value. And what I mean by that is that right to work has become uh, an incredibly powerful tool for branding the state of South Carolina as business friendly. Um, you know, Nikki Haley. Uh, you know, used right to work among, you know, uh, other statistics and policies to uh, um, uh, suppress labor and to attract business to South Carolina. And, uh, you know, when when asked, she said, uh, you know, we don't want to taint the uh, the water uh, uh, and have uh, uh, unions coming in here. Um, and uh, thank you, Cecil. Ab absolutely. I mean, and this is not just Nikki Haley, right? This is uh, all of the, the last several administrations. This has been mainstream public policy, mainstream economic development strategies is to sell the state on, uh, you know, our, our ample supply of low wage workers and our lax regulation of, uh, of the environmental and um, uh, occupational law. So, uh, so it has, you know, in that sense, I think right to work has a great um, uh, symbolic value. But I also think there's a, 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 a psychological value uh, to right to work. Uh, and, and that is, and, and again, you know, I've heard this many, many times, I suspect you have as well. But there's this notion that in South Carolina, that unions are illegal because of right to work. 
And so what I think that does is it 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 really from the 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 start it kind of dampens uh, it sours people on uh, the the idea of organization or unionization. So in both of those senses, I think the the real power of right to work is um, uh, it, it's symbolic and psychological and. And what we as activists, as, as public people, we, we uh, run the danger of reinforcing that psychological and symbolic power of, of right to work. Um, it, you know, it's, it's not entirely clear uh, that union density would be markedly higher in South Carolina um, if, uh, uh, you know, if, if workers had uh, the, the the rights to organize and and uh, uh, and we we did not have uh, right to work legislation. Um, you know what we've discovered, especially in the, the last couple Republican administrations, is that the National Labor Relations Act, which you know had for so many years been uh, uh, you know provided the the base upon which the the labor movement could grow, and it provided protections for several generations of American workers, uh, but that under conservative administrations, um, the, the uh, National Labor Relations Board has not been our friend. And um, just to give a couple of, of uh, South Carolina uh, related examples of the ways in which there's a danger in over uh, an over-reliance on the state and labor laws is uh, in 1956, uh, you know, one of the, the uh, you know, first uh, major organizing drives after right to work, uh, the um, uh, Deering Milliken and Company in Darlington uh, lost a union election. And then rather than negotiate with the employees, uh, they, they just shut down operations. Now, technically, that's uh, illegal. You can't do that under labor law, but uh, it was so mired in legal complexity that, um, you know, ultimately the, the workers, uh, you know, just lost out and uh, Milliken was able to, to shut down that plant. So, um, you know, there's your, your rights on paper and then, um, you know, they're, they're the realities. The, the other, you know, recent example, and this is still a, a struggle in progress and we're hoping for a more positive outcome but uh, you know, we think of all of the great organizing that's been done in the, the Starbucks uh, stores ac across the country and in the, the elections uh, in which the, the workers have won, the unions won, uh, uh, several in, in South Carolina, but we're stuck on uh, you know, not getting contracts that um, you know, Starbucks policy has been to, um, uh, really to, to stonewall and not negotiate in good faith. And they're counting on the bureaucracy uh, and the, the process uh, and their, their deep pockets um, to um, really wait it out and, uh, you know, hope that um, uh, uh, the union goes away. So um, I think then that, you know, in South Carolina, with a lot of the movement-based organizing that uh, many of us are connected to. I'm thinking of the Union of Southern Service Workers, new, newly established in uh, Columbia a few months ago, uh, thinking about uh, healthcare workers in uh, the Low Country who I've worked with and are, are part of a, a, a non majority union, uh, and the, the campus workers at USC, among others. Um, it's unlikely that they'll ever be afforded protections under the, the National Labor Relations Act that um, and, and a big part of the strategy has been to think through uh, what other levers can be used to force employers to you know, uh, pay better and um, uh, 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 you know, improve working conditions. Uh, and there's a, an argument to be made, and I, I think the, 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 the Wagner Act is a, a good example of this, that the, uh, the, the governmental mechanisms, the bureaucracy, the reforms, uh, the structures, they're going to take shape in response 
uh, to the movement, you know, just as they did in the 1930s as a mechanism for ordering what was disordered. Um, I think the kind of a, a next wave or next brave through breakthrough will uh, reflect the same kinds of dynamics. And I'm hoping that we can all put that to the test. So let me um, shut up there and uh, just see what <laughs> thoughts you all have. I want to answer any questions that I may not have gotten to in the, the, um, the chat and, um, and then just see what, what else is out there. All I'm right. going to stop share so I can see some of your faces too. This is difficult looking into the screen, staring into this abyss and uh, trying to maintain some connection. Well, first off, we have a great hand to Dr. Carrie Taylor for a fantastic presentation. And one of the things I want to do right now, of course, is address uh, first some of the questions in the chat. And there was a really important question that I actually want to also uh, give an answer to as well. Uh, there was a question um, from Kim. It's uh, how is the city case related to labor? I also need more understanding here. Um, I want to intervene with that question really quickly because one of the things about the Majesta School that's worth pointing out and worth reminding ourselves of is that the school is about the interplay of race, class, union organizing, et cetera. And what Dr. Taylor was getting at there is that in the post-World War II period, from really 1945 through 1954, you have this tremendous moment in American history where on the one hand, you have a, a human rights movement that's trying to make gains in the post-World War II period that is fighting on multiple fronts, on the fronts of, of course, labor on the one hand and civil rights on the other. But what Dr. Taylor was pointing out was that there's also a massive counter-reaction, really a counter-revolution to all of that throughout the country. Like that's not only the era of Operation Dixie, it's also the era of the Second Red Scare. And these things are not all coincidence. So what he's pointing out with, with the Sydney case and other cases of, of racial violence in the South is that this is part and parcel of a larger struggle. And you don't have to just take my word for it. Let me actually read you a quote from a... Um, a, an interview given by Majeska Simpkins in 1976, this is part of the UNC Oral History Project, where she was asked about her entry into the human rights movement and how she was seeing how different things were being used to fight against the new and change in progress. And I'll read this, this is from 1976. Um, she, she said here, so they use that sex thing and they have used it as a social equality angle. They want to keep those forces apart, again, the, the forces of human rights and, and, and labor and such. And they want to see that Negroes wouldn't take your job. And here's where the key part comes in, Knight's nice lesson. When the unions come in, they try, and they being white conservatives, try to tell whites, if you get a union, the Negroes will take your job. They'll be making much as much as you make or they'll bring your salary down to theirs and all that kind of stuff. It's to divide the forces. They have always done that. And that's the reason a white populist is not able to get anywhere much in the South. Um, so again, what Simpkins is talking about is much the same thing as what Dr. Taylor talking about this evening in terms of how these various forces, labor, civil rights, human rights, how Whenever they are all advancing, they don't do it separately. They have to do it together. But the counterattack against them also hits all those forces at once. That's the same reason why I began tonight's class with a, a, a brief paragraph from Dr. King about if the Negro wins, then labor wins. So this is, again, a classic lesson that we're seeing play out time and time again. Yeah, you know, um... Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> all of that. Uh, but you 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 think about a, a biracial strike in a multiracial strike in in Charleston in 1946. I mean, this is the ruling class's nightmare. You know, this is the the worst of all outcomes, and you know their challenge is to then put the the genie back in the bottle that um, uh, African Americans, you know, women, you know, really all Americans have had this taste of 
something different, a, a taste of freedom, and uh, and they they want more of it. And um, you know, on the other side of that, the um, uh, the the employers are well aware of the stakes, and um, you know, are going to use whatever tools are at their disposal to to um, un, un, undo uh, you know what had been the, the progress that had been achieved in the the 30s and 40s. Precisely. And another question from the chat, and again, as we get more questions in, please feel free to, to raise them. Uh, this is from Cecil. Uh, the, the organizing of the Communication Workers of America um, at Southern Bell in 1955, did it reach South Carolina? Yes. It sure did. Uh, yeah. So it was, uh, you know, th that was when the CWA local here in South Carolina was established. And, um, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, it's been a, a very positive and powerful force within the labor movement uh, since then. The former state president, Donna DeWitt, comes out of that local. Uh huh. Okay, any, um, oh, go ahead. I see the question in the back. And please raise your voice for that. <clears throat> One small comment and then a qu uh, question comment. Um, so I, I was a state employee when uh, Nikki Haley was governor and the gym was introduced where we'd have to all answer the phones with it's a great day in South Carolina. <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting. That was at the unemployment office too, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not that um, but I do remember around the same time um, attending a talk where I think one of the speakers was from Harvest Hope and there were uh, three, three women on the panel, but they talked about how a lot of times the state is bringing in um, uh, employers and giving them a lot of tax breaks and such, but a lot of the people who were their clients in, you know, Harvest Hope, like uh, food banks and such, were actually working one, two, three jobs. So the comment she made at the time was, don't just bring anybody into the state, bring people who can actually pay wages that are living wages. And have, have you noticed something similar with like, you know, the argument is made, we're bringing a lot of employers in, but what kind of employers are being brought in? And I, I might have missed it. Who was it that was saying, you know, we need to think about the quality of the employers? Like it was somebody who worked at either Harvest Hope or, or Red Cross, some, some food bank. That, um, yeah, just based on the client that they got at Food Bank. Yep. There's, you know, great research that's been done, I think, from maybe the Institute for Policy Studies, or no, it was actually the Labor Center in uh, Oakland, where, uh, you know, they've looked at uh, the, the ways in which we're, we're all subsidizing McDonald's and Walmart. Uh, and in, in some cases, those major employers are uh, tutoring their employees on how to apply for benefits uh, so that they can uh, bring their living standard up to, you know, the, the, the bare minimum. Um, and then, you know, in terms of, I mean, the, the whole issue of uh, incentives and, you know, recruiting, um, you know, businesses to, to South Carolina, I mean, that's, that's uh, right in the, the wheelhouse of the South Carolina Progressive Network over the years in terms of tracking this stuff and, you know, raising the, the big issues. And I'm sure, you know, Brett could share with us some uh, you know, some of the most egregious examples of that. Huh. Brett would be certainly willing to, but it would be a long story, Dr. Taylor. Okay. <laughs> I, I follow the money and I watch policy be determined. The, the most two impactful policies that hurt working people, which is a lot of us, were the um, passage in 2017 uh, by the governor signing the a uh, bill that disallows municipalities and counties to have any employee benefits. So what, what it, if you look at it from the other side of the coin, is that we not only do not have a sick law, a sick leave bill that allows employees that are sick to stay home and not get fired, we have a law against sick leave. That bill was supported by the National Restaurant Association, referred to as the other NRA. Fast forward a couple of years and the COVID thing comes and the, the governor's uh, budget for COVID was written 
by the South Carolina Hospitality Association, which is funded in Maine by members of the National Restaurant Association. And we had, we, we, literally, we literally had fights uh, in the legislature over the fact that you could be fired if your boss told you not to wear a mask and you wanted to wear a mask and you would not get uh, unemployment. Mm -hmm. And so it was clear that the tail wagging the dog of the working class was the National Restaurant Association with their lackeys in the legislature. Mm -hmm. And we had the, we had the money to prove it. The governor got $68,000 and then the committees that signed the bills got, got greased. And so if you want to know who was winning, follow the money. Go ahead, please, sir. Sorry about that. Well, we should be. Um, my question is, you, during your presentation, you mentioned that the managers of the textile plant had to go to D.C. to ask for codes to be written for their particular industry to be able to pay um, the workers the, the increase that they were asking for. My question is, why did it, they just pay the people? What what was so significant in the codes that, that they needed the codes to be written and implemented in order for them to pay? You know, I think the, the logic of, uh, and these are, they, and I may have misspoke, but they, they weren't textile workers themselves. These are in a, a slightly different industry and the, these bagging mills that didn't fall under the, the textile codes. But under the National Industrial Recovery Act, Franklin Roosevelt, it, it basically became a, a, a you know, the, the, the federal government took unprecedented control over the, the economy in setting prices, setting wages. And the, the idea there was to stabilize the industry. So I suspect that the bagging mill wanted to see those codes um, uh, uh, passed or imposed nationally so as not to give any advantage to their competitors. But, but you know, beyond that, I, I don't have any specific insights, but um, but that would be my my guess. Was the government subsidizing wages at that time? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions in the room before we go back to the chat questions? Dr. Taylor, is there nobody, uh, no states that allow, you said that in the incarcerated can't be union members. Incarcerated people cannot be union members. Is that, that whose rule is that? The individual unions, the FLCIO, the federal government, state? That's, um, no, I mean, I think that, yeah, I can't remember the specifics, but it goes right to the um, the Thirteenth Amendment, uh, in that you're not afforded, you know, many of the the rights that uh, a person who's not, uh, if you're incarcerated, you're not afforded those same kinds. You're not guaranteed those same kinds of protections. So I think, you know, my I I think that incarcerated workers have figured out ways around that. They figured out ways to struggle collectively. But um, I think that the challenge is, you know, when this has been raised as a legal challenge, I think the determination has been that, um, you know, they, they don't have the, the same rights that, um, uh, you know, other Americans would have. Does that answer that? Was that, that was Brett, right? Yeah, we won't dance with the head of that. Too, and I've got another question for you. Can I, can I go for it? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about honey attack. We, we, we talked about it yesterday, but we we, we didn't uh, hit on it today at all. So, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, in you know, I, I'll say a couple things, and other people can jump in. But um, at Honey a Path was um, re really uh, in the during the the 1934 general textile strike. That was a real turning point because what happened is the employer had deputized uh, uh, several of his employees and other people in town to, you know, quote unquote, protect the mill. And uh, those deputies ended up shooting seven workers and trade unionists 
uh, in most of whom were shot and killed, uh, shot in the back and killed. And so when those seven workers died in Honeypath, um, that was that it really sent a shock, I think, throughout the um, uh, you know throughout the 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 uh, the union, and um, uh, coupled with um, the you know massive show of force uh, in which the you know, state guard were called out and uh, imprisoned um, a number of uh, well jailed and and held a number of um, strikers and their families. Um, you know, that level of repression, I think, was enough to, to break the strike. Um, the film shows that uh, in, in Georgia, there were members of these so-called flying squadrons, union families who were rounded up, and they were put, uh, they, were, they were held in a prison in Atlanta that had been built to house uh, German prisoners during World War I. And so it was just, you know, as a um, for, you know, humble people um, uh, to, um, be, you know, to to go to um, to be put in prison, um, you know, that I mean, that was a real, um, yeah, it was a source of shame, you know, and then to to go back to the community uh, after having gone through that experience. Uh, um, you know that uh, so so together with Honeypath, the the repression, and then after the strike, the blacklist um, that really you know it crushed the spirit of the the workers in the strike. Gary, I want to get a little deeper into your observation that you didn't think you don't think you or at least you expressed that the free rider element of a right to work stage doesn't really suppress organizing. And I've, I've watched Matt come in, Matt Truck come into Winsboro and Matt Truck leave. And, and, and we've been meeting to talk to people that were saying, why the hell should I pay union dues? They have to represent me anyway. And I think that if we talk about there being open shops and closed shops, you know, we don't use those terms anymore. People would understand better that the closed shop meant that if the majority of the workers voted to have a union, you had to be in a union when you came into that company. And the open shop meant that you could come in and be a free rider on the work of the union members that worked to be able to, to negotiate your better wages, your better benefits without you paying dues. And then there's some instances where there's a, a fee for the free riders. So speak to that, please. Uh, you know, but I, I'm probably overstating my case, but I'm thinking about this from a, a kind of a movement perspective is that for most of us, and that this this doesn't go for you, April, this this I'm not not talking to you, Russell, uh, where absolutely the National Labor Relations Board is something you've got to pay attention to and you've got to work to, uh, you know, move to an election and negotiate a first contract and uh, all that good stuff. That's absolutely not unimportant, but I'm thinking about this from a South Carolina kind of movement perspective, and I'm looking at a union density rate, you know, the, the lowest in the, the country, one or two percent. I think we're a lot, most of us are a long way off before the, the, the front shifts to uh, the NLRB. I think we've got to do a whole lot more groundwork, uh, agitation, Really finding where the the weaknesses are and and prodding those. I mean, if it's the, you know, if the NLRB offers something, um, you know, absolutely, we've got to to pursue that. But I'm kind of stepping back and and making my argument from a um, uh, a South Carolina perspective. I'll accept that we've got 60 years of miseducation that overcome. Mm -hmm. We want to play. Yeah. Say a lot longer than that. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, we've got a question from Randall, and I'll come back to a question here in the room. Randall, go ahead, please. Um, I think that that one thing that might make a difference uh, and and maybe uh, soften our, our pessimism is the fact when you have national, large national corporations like Boeing or Volvo, or um, the, the tire company, uh, Michelin, 
who come in with either national or international representation for um, engineers and all that, that kind of is a wedge that regardless of what the local customs are here in the state, um, what does that mean for uh, participation in those national unions by locals here? So, yeah. Do we lose Gary? Yes. Yeah, well, I think his. Um, uh, he's frozen. You're not up, Gary. You scared him off, right? Uh, you know, is you know for most of the the machinist union, but um, you know they failed in their several attempts to organize Boeing in Charleston, and um, you know I think. To some degree, it was an effective appeal for the workers from Seattle to come down and uh, share with the workers in Charleston, you know, the, the benefits that they enjoy under a union contract, but it didn't go all that far. So there, there were limits to that. But are there other specific situations that you're thinking of? Smithfield Foods? No, I'm just thinking about my neighbor who's an engineer and he works for Boeing and he's presumably in some uh, exotic union. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't know enough to, to say anything one way or another. Okay, we've got a question in the back here and then we'll get back to Rick on Zoom. Um, so when Trump took office, I went from being a free rider myself to joining, uh, being a paid member of the union at my work, and I kind of equate, <laughs> and I kind of equate that to. Uh, well, I'm wondering if that is was a similar movement among other people. If you saw an increased Increase number, number of people, of people like formally joining their unions, similar to what happened with. Um, like the media, people investing in the subscriptions to the New York Times and things to support the free media under an administration that was trying to tap down on those bit. Did you hear my question? My question being, was there an increased number of paid members and unions? Uh, like specifically in the, the New York Times situation? No, like You're under the Trump administration. Second. I'm sorry, under which administration? Trump. Remember the president? Was oh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, I'm, uh, no, I, I think the, you know, we've con continued our downward slide. I don't, I don't think there was a, um, you, you know, I think, I think the, the bigger picture is we're seeing kind of a, you know, an uptick in creative organizing activity. And we're all really excited about Things like the fight for fifteen and the uh, the creative organizing around Starbucks, but um, I don't think the numbers uh, bear out any uh, great increase. Uh, in fact, I, I think they show a, a continuing, you know, if slight decline. But April or Russell might have more recent numbers. Back on it, um, come on up here. It's. There were actually, it was a decrease with amongst white people, but amongst people of color, union membership is it went up drastically more so than any other year prior. Uh, during interesting, so that's all I got. I can step away from the podium. And um, I will say, I am a, I'm a, I'm a federal employee, um, thirty years with the federal government, and those were the worst four years of my entire career, but. <laughs> I will tell you, we did see an increase in membership because there was an all out attack on federal workers. Oh, yeah. And um, so I mean, we, we, we said, listen, we've got to band together. You've got to be part of this. You've got to join and give us the support so we could fight back. We actually took some things to court um, over what was being um, brought down on us. So 
Um, yes, we did see an increase, but then unfortunately, after we got rid of that mess, then COVID hit and we, we lost a lot of membership during, during the COVID time. So, um, but hopefully uh, we're, we're trying our best to get, you know, back into it and, and letting, you know, federal workers know that, you know, having a union is important. I mean, they are represented, you know, by, because all the majority of the federal uh, agencies are represented by some type of union. Um, but we're trying to get those ones that do not uh, give that support to let them know that we are stronger together. We're stronger in numbers. And when the agency looks at a list and you've got 150 members, and then they look at a list and you've got 1,500 members, it makes a difference. It really does. So, so yes, we're, 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 we're trying to get back up there. <laughs> I'm a federal employee too, by the way. I'm the one who asked the question. <laughs> okay, uh, Rick, you've had your hand raised for some time virtually. Go ahead, please. We're just talking about AFGE. <laughs> okay. Yes, go right ahead, please. Okay. Um, I just want to make a an observation, a comment about um South Carolina in the international um arena. Um, Nikki Haley and whoever to invite um, companies to South Carolina go out and advertise internationally. You know, lack of regulation, um, right to work state. Those kind of comments are traditionally what have been criticisms of third world countries, um, of, of China even. You know, oh, they don't have any regulations. They don't have, you know, they don't have unions. That, that is the problem. Um, but, you know, they jumped, you know, Nikki Haley at all, you know, jumped on this and said, oh, yeah, South Carolina can be a third world country also. And then as a result, at least some influence on that was BMW, BMW coming to South Carolina and, and they're huge. Absolutely. No question. BMW is a German company. German law requires that unions have a place on the board of directors. The board of directors at BMW includes a union representative, presumably to help guide the country, to the company, to um, you know, influence where they're going, make sure that there's you know, an undue exploitation. And what does BMW do? They come to right to work South Carolina. Now, I now I'm going to go out on a limb with you know possible speculation, but you know it it ends up being a, another way to divide the international labor movement. If the if the um, union members in Germany can get a better hand, you know if they can become a stronger part of the you know worker aristocracy. Okay, fine. Then we're going to go ahead and take advantage of those exploited workers in South Carolina. The, the splitting of the labor movement doesn't happen just within South Carolina or the U.S. It's, it's an international phenomenon. Um, it's also how, how Walmart can, gets into this, a, able to, they, they get stuff from China. And they get it from China and they sell it cheap to their poor workers who the poor workers who work for Walmart also have to get public assistance in the U.S. You know, there's it's it's capital subsidizing capital. So it, it, the comment I went off a little bit too much here, but but the idea of BMW with workers on the board of directors deciding to take advantage of a third world country being South Carolina, you know, really it. it it's it, it can become a big impediment to union solidarity around the world, which to me is is crucial. You know, I think that's a really important point. Um, although I, I would point out, um, as we're talking about comparing the U.S. to, to third world or developing countries, um, I'll just read you a couple of the statistics that just came out a couple of months ago. Uh, <clears throat> of all countries in 2020, the United States possessed the highest infant mortality rate at 5.4 deaths per 1,000 live births, 
which is markedly higher than the 1.6 deaths per 1,000 live births in Norway, which mm -hmm. has the lowest mortality rate. Uh, just last week, some stats came out about the South in particular having some of the worst mortality rates, I believe, in the entire Western Hemisphere. So um, I think, again, what we're seeing here is the relationship between labor, race, gender, all these issues that we discussed this semester, they are still really proving to be important to how we think about these things in the here and now. Um, speaking of in the here and now, there's an interesting question in the chat, and Dr. Taylor, I think you should definitely take a crack at this one first. Uh, this is from Hannah, Hannah Bauer. She asks, uh, it feels like this is part of the current attack on education and specifically public education today. The goal is to keep people uneducated so they're forced to accept worse working conditions and lower wages. Thoughts? So I might have missed the, what is it that's part of the larger attack on education? I'll read the question again. Um, yeah. I feel like this is part of the current attack on education and specifically public education today. The goal is to keep people uneducated so they're forced to accept worse working conditions and lower wages. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I suspect, you know, my sense and, and you know, somebody who really looks at, uh, you know, uh, public education, higher education, um, you, you know, needs to, to really pick this one apart. But my sense is we're moving uh, in a, a, the kind of direction of a two-tiered educational system that at the, the high school and college level, you know, the, the Boeings and BMWs and uh, whatever, you know, high-tech employers are, are moving to the state are going to require some number of um, highly educated, highly skilled South Carolinians to, to take those jobs, um, but that um, there'll be a continuing need for, um, for low-wage workers, for um, you know, uh, yeah, for 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 the rest of the jobs, for the work. <laughs> um, so I, you know, that, and I, I think, you know, it's, um, you know, part of that is channeling public funds to uh, private ends, to to charter schools, and uh, you know, defunding or systematically attacking the 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 teachers and and public education. I mean. I, I, you know, I I don't think you need to be a conspiracy theorist to to you know see that at at play. Well, I am a conspiracy theorist, but it's based on reality, and that this move towards the assaulting public education, Ronald Reagan said it best that the government is not the solution to the problem; it's the problem, and that we have the the public education is the latest multi-billion dollar operation that can be privatized. And you do that by those hysteria that they're whipping up. Meanwhile, back at the US post office, they're trying to privatize the post office. And they're, they're yeah, and they're cutting their, they, the post office, I still think, uh, Rick Petalinus has been a postal employee for many years, Rick can correct me. They burden the postal work, postal system up with enough uh, uh, retirement money to pitch ahead for something like 75 years. And so yes, there is a, a really coordinated attempt on the part of the operative people in the federal government to set things like that, like uh, Commissioner DeLay, I believe, is still in charge. No, DeJoy, excuse me. DeJoy. He's taking the joy out of the post office. Right. But there, but there, this is a really concerted effort to destroy the public's involvement in sustaining America. And what you do is you cut taxes and the government doesn't work. And then they say, see, it doesn't work. Self-fulfilling prophecy. And I would just add to that, I'm actually serving um, on a dissertation committee of a anthropologist out of Arizona who's looking at uh, low-wage work in South Carolina and looking at the tie between that and the education system in the state. And what she's finding is that um, a lot of parts of the state that really poorly fun education and the like, what they're finding is that they're having, on the one hand, a harder time attracting high paying jobs. On the other hand, the jobs they are attracting, they're trying to suppress any attempts at labor organizing because they're saying, we don't want to scare off these companies 
because again, as Taylor pointed out, the state has acquired reputation for not only right to work laws, but being quote unquote business friendly. We're one of the, we're one of the states that gives more tax in lieu of uh, of agreements to companies than any other state in the country. And in Chester, for example, has the, one of the largest to GT Tire, which is a foreign owned company. It's got almost hundred million dollars in taxpayer subsidies, which is basically mortgaging our children's future by taking money that would have gone to public education. Mm -hmm. So you keep them uneducated and poor, then they have to go work at your factory. And they can Our speak the language, kid. shit language, shit wages. <laughs> Are you too tired to do anything besides work 16 hour days? And then I find people asleep in their car when I go to the Hey, any other questions or comments? Okay, I had a question about you said that the, the Carolinas were the most militant. In the protesting movements or the the union the militant militancy of unions uh, i'm thinking in the 40s 30s 40s maybe leading into the 50s what do you base that on you know i i think i think the heart the heart of the strike was you know here in the uh, the carolinas that um uh, you know it's uh the I, th I think the um, you know th this is where you saw like most of the conflagrations and the uh, the you know efforts to violently suppress the strike and a willingness on the part of the strikers to to push back. Um, so, but you know, I think the uprising uh, thirty four mentions that um, you know it it makes mention one of the union officials makes mention of the the fighting spirit of the Southerners. Um, there's the example, this is Alabama, not the Carolinas, but uh, the, the decision to strike was being put to the, the membership and uh, a local out of Gadsden, Alabama, they just went out on strike anyway. They didn't wait for the national union to vote on it. They were just so pissed off. They, um, they walked out and began the strike, you know, a week or two before uh, the rest of the workers. So that that's, you know, a little bit of what I'm going on. Yeah, I think that it's a, it sometimes works in diametrically opposed directions where, as Majeska said, when the pressure comes down, the movement builds up. But when the repression comes down, like it did in the near path, the movement steps back. And so it's kind of like a push me, pull you type of thing that we have <laughs> to go through sometimes a generation to be able to come back. And I want to ask you if you, had any awareness of any bonus army participation from South Carolina in the what was 33 when Wilson was president, Roosevelt hadn't stepped in and they kicked, they kicked the soldiers off to the, the uh, mall area. Uh, you know, uh, short answer is, is I have like hazy recollections of some documentation either from newspapers or maybe in the Roosevelt papers, but I, I can't, uh, can't provide any kind of detail but um it stands to reason the you know the bonus army was massive and there absolutely must have been carolinians who were were part of that effort to put pressure on the federal administration to pay out the the bonuses they'd been promised uh for uh fighting during world war one they, they wanted an early payout um you know arguing that um you know they they were desperate that uh, they needed their 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 bonus money now, and uh, that became a, 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 a publicity nightmare uh, for the um, uh, the Hoover administration. Yeah, it was a, a little bit of gas for the New Deal too. Also, yep. 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 Well, there's an interesting question in the chat from uh, Cecil. He asked. Do you think because average consumers may think that unionization leads to higher prices, it's a good reason to oppose unions? Um, you mean for for the the people who are giving who are voicing these uh, yeah. these these hesitations or the, this opposition or their commerce? Yeah, I think it's really a question about organizations like the Chamber of Commerce, for example, other groups that 
will pose certain arguments against unionization yeah. and the idea of we're actually trying to help the consumer by yeah, yeah. I'm I'm sure that's that, that's an effective line, you know, that's a line that has some level of effectiveness. I think, you know, what we're seeing though in, in terms of the general public and their positive uh impression of unions, it's it's moving in a, a good direction that you know, uh, more and more Americans are saying, if I had a choice at work, I would join a union. And, uh, you know, and uh, I guess, you know, this argument, uh, you know, regarding uh, consumer prices and, well, any of the objections against um, uh, organizing, um, I think, you know, it, it, this is sort of what I was getting at during the presentation that in a way, you know, what we got to do is we, we got to got, find our folks and run with them. And we can't waste too much time trying to convince people who've really already made up their mind about the issue. Um, you know, it's, it's just, there are too many good people who are ready to move. And that's who we need to, to really focus on. And, uh, and so in that sense, you know, it's my feeling that our conversation around right to work and sometimes, you know, we're, we're giving it more power than it should have, because we've got to be thinking about what we can do, what we are doing, you know, where are the, the, the employer's weak spots, and we, we got to go at them hard. But, um, but I think, you know, the continuing conversation around right to work, in a sense, it, it fortifies this notion that many, many South Carolinians have that unions are illegal in South Carolina. And we, we got to do something about that. Right, exactly. Well, uh, if, uh, are we winding it down? I'm, I want to ask the last question. Go ahead. I'm going to leave it with a high note and then let Sarah say something to leave it here for not slitting our wrist. That one of the things that is really good that's happening in South Carolina, especially right here uh, in this building, was that. I've been a union member since 1981, and the average age was like over 60, and the energy level was just about moribund. And just in the last, well, I watched 10 years ago working with the fast food workers that didn't catch any traction. In the past year, this year, this year, the last not, not few months, the Union of Southern Service Workers, the USSW, which is supported by the Service Employees International Union. And SEIU, for good or bad, is the largest growing union in America because service work is the only damn jobs we've got. And that in this room, uh, about four or five Tuesdays ago, there was a meeting of, there were probably 35 people in the room uh, that the average age was probably 28. And these are service workers from Starbucks, and there were some Amazon workers here. And this room and that broadcast system that we see Dr. Taylor on now was the nexus for a meeting in Atlanta and a meeting in Raleigh of these same workers of Southern YP. They voted for a strike to go out the subsequent Tuesday. The evening that they voted for a strike in this room, Bernie Sanders had his first meeting of his committee on labor and health care. And he had that afternoon that they voted for a strike, the former CEO of Starbucks, and he was grilling him unmercifully. It was, well, it was, it was a joy to watch and very painful. <laughs> but um, the guy kept saying, oh, our workers love us. It's like, you know, it wasn't obviously true to the people that just voted for a strike. And the subsequent Tuesday, they walked out from Atlanta and, and Columbia and Charlotte and all around the South. And that's just happened in the last month and a half. And it's a delightful thing to see at least another generation catching the wind. And so, yeah, uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, again, thanks to Dr. Terry Taylor for a fantastic evening. Uh, two mics in the world. And special thanks to Sarah Williams for her, her great rendition of yeah. yeah. that as well. So um, the next two weeks, we've got some really interesting classes that, again, tie back to what uh, Dr. Pillar mentioned this uh, evening. Next week, we're getting into separate and unequal and the idea of school equalization in South Carolina, the battle over education in the state during the civil rights era. Uh, we'll have Cecil Cahoon who will be talking 
uh, next week, along with Dr. Melissa Brown and Professor John Krangle. They all bring some unique perspectives on desegregation of education in South Carolina during the 1950s and 60s and how a lot of the issues we talked about tonight relate to that battle for education as well. That's next Monday, May 8th. And May 15th, we're really honored to bring in uh, Bill Fletcher, an internationally recognized community labor organizer. There you go. Uh, to talk a bit more about how the human rights campaigns of the 20th century have been under tremendous and continuous assault by the federal government, by COINTELPRO, the Palmer Raid, so on and so forth. Um, so the next two weeks, as is always the case, we're bringing all these lessons together. Again, this is not just about the history of South Carolina. It's about what we can do in the here and now, which is, as we've learned this evening, a hell of a lot. So until next Monday, have a good rest of your week, and we'll see you talk about separate and unequal and how we can make that truly equal in this state. Thank you.